Father, we bless you and praise you for your amazing love and mercies to us. And, and give us a fresh vision of who you are. As we sung, be thou our vision. And we pray for these that are in times of uh, serious physical need. We ask that you might be the great physician upon them. And that their minds and hearts would be stayed upon you. Father, as we look at principles and verses in the word of God about dealing with our thoughts and our words, uh, quicken them to our hearts. And we bless you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're taking a little side journey from uh, straight through a book in the Bible. We'll get to that in fairly short order. But we have the, you have your uh, copy with you? Everybody have one? So we're going through the ear gate and the eye gate as we deal with the issue of being offended. And we're using the word offended. We went over some of the scriptures in a different context in which that's used. And we're using it in the context that life tumbles in on us and we get offended. We get in our mind, we get upset. We would get resentful. We get bitter. We get angry. And uh, the, temp, the, the, the usual situation is that we don't take responsibility. We blame something or someone for our response. And the good news is that's not true. <laughs> because if that is true, and if they or it is responsible, then you're just a pawn. There's nothing you can do. You have no control over, over whether or not you can ever win that battle. Because we cannot control circumstances, nor can we control other people. So the really good news is that God wants to transform us. Life tumbles in, and God is up to something in us. And we've, we've made mention of this, we've emphasized this. This was brought up last week, that... We have to grab this in the mind. As a man thinks, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. But here is here's the, the issue. We, we're not in church. We're not in the church building. And so when we're in the church building... Uh, we're nice, and we say, hello, and how do you do, and it's good to see you. And we get back in the car on the way home, and then we take up where we left off. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen to you. It's happened to me uh, many years ago. We drove 190 miles to the church I was supposed to preach at somewhere in South Texas. And I was already about half hot because we did not leave when I thought we should to get that far down the road. And then going down the road, uh, the navigator uh, gave a misdirection and we went the wrong turn. So now we're really late. And we drive up in the parking lot of this country church and they're already singing. So we put on our smiles and walked in and preached and went on about our business. And from one sense, we can smile at that and say, or we can say that's tragic. But it's very common. And it was nothing, for my part, nothing but sin. I should have been the spiritual leader in all of that. Instead, I was dragging my wife down and quenching and grieving the spirit. Uh, so we spent a, a good bit of time talking about it from that level. Then we started... Uh, and I don't know what page this is on your material, but we, we started with the um, looking at the solution, the, the, the biblical strategy that we employ to win these battles. And first of all, we, we talked about this one. Love the Word of God. Love the Word of God. So turn with me in your Bible to... Uh, a most familiar passage, Psalm 23. We often don't think about this as a uh, 
actually, actually, uh, Psalm 1. I only missed it by 23. <laughs> Psalm 1. So, we're looking at, we, we, we say, well, I read the Bible, and I study the Bible, and I'm in Bible class, or I teach Bible class, or I preach, or whatever. Um, the blessing comes at what point? When it comes to our getting into the Scripture. I'm not saying there's no blessing in those other points. Uh, they're the foundation that gets to the most important point. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Meditation upon the Word of God is when the Scriptures begin to get in our bloodstream. And there's not a single one of us here, but we know that. And yet we content ourselves to be very shy in our meditation upon the Word of God. We're too busy. And uh, I was reading something recently. A man who was struggling uh, in his spiritual walk, and he decided to take one of the epistles, one of the short epistles, four, five, six chapters, and spend the whole month. Uh, he might have read something else, but he primarily spent the whole month reading that entire epistle every day and praying what he read. And it would be things of praise, things of repentance, things of rejoicing, uh, putting off the old man, putting on the new man, but just meditating upon that same passage over and over and over again. You know, there's a principle here that the world understands and that we sometimes, when it comes to the Christian life, we put it aside. The value of repetition. Did any of you, uh, when you were a child, did you just get on a bike and the first time you said, away you go and didn't fall down? I had training wheels, so I could do that. <laughs> okay. Started with training wheels. I still, uh, this is a different story, but... Um, Back in the early 70s, or mid-70s, we went on a little journey down to Hendersonville to the uh, skate ring, skating ring. Anyway, you put on skates, and you go around in a circle. And, and I had never had on a pair of skates. And even at that age, I felt a little bit fragile. <laughs> and it took me a while to get around one time. And I was horizontal rather than vertical more than once. And after one time, I took the skates off. I've been here. I've done that. That's enough. Well, there were two little boys. There were twins. About must have been about five, six time, five, six years, and that about that tall. If they fell once, they fell dozens of times. But you know, before that night was over, they were zooming around and round and round and just having the time of their life. They didn't quit in their journey of repeating and, and, and learning. And that's just a temporal thing. But it shows the human ability. Frankly, even apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit, as a human being, God has equipped you with a mind and with an ability to turn on a dime. Now, you energize that with the Holy Spirit. You energize that with a passion to heed, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now you've got something. And all of our excuses just went out the window. So, with that in mind, uh, let's go back and, and follow up. We were looking at the, the ways in which God has given us um, uh, solutions, ability, empowerment 
to overcome this incredible spiritual problem of being offended, being resentful, being bitter, uh, falling for anger. So loving the Word of God. And la either last week or the week before, we read a number of the verses at the top of your page, Psalm 119, 165, and those in that section. Uh, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. When we are meditating upon the word of God, and we are, we are enhancing our fellowship with the Lord, uh, we fill our minds with the word of God, and it just kills the offended spirit, or it kills the lust. And so, um, tying in with that, if we talk about meditation upon the Word of God, then we have to come to grips with, am I willing for God to be God in my life? That's going to be the, 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 the line where I cross from just having information to transformation. I really want God's will. I really want to honor God. And in Romans chapter 1, the mark of the ungodly was that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. And so they had knowledge about God, but they were not willing for God to be God. You know, I'm going to run my life here. I'm going to hold on to my, my way of dealing with this. Everywhere we turn in the scripture, we find uh, ammunition, we find food, we find spiritual weapons, and, and so many of them revolve around what we do with the Word of God. And there, there are two primary things that the Word of God is there for us, for. And the first one is to reveal God himself. As someone has said, God has given us the word of God that we might know, grow in intimacy of knowing the God of the word. Fear is a great motivation, but love is a greater one. The more I love the Lord, the more these other things will fall off. And so if I'm reading the word of God in order to have fellowship with God, then that's going to empower me when Temptation, be it lust, anger, resentment, whatever, greed, whatever comes up on the door. Then from the passage in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, the word of God is profitable for doctrine, for uh, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so I, I must not be content just to, I've had my devotions. I'm reading through the Bible and I've read my chapters. I must be going to the Word of God. I must be teaching or listening to the Bible study or the sermon or whatever, knowing that God is up to something to instruct me, to teach me doctrine, to rebuke me. There are things where I was on the wrong track. This is wrong. You've got to leave that. There's no justification for that. It doesn't matter what they did. I'm speaking to you. I'm not speaking to them. Well, don't they have an issue? Yes, but that's my business. God would have us to understand. And so he rebukes us. He doesn't just rebuke us. He points us. He corrects us. He puts us on the right path. And instructs us in righteousness. That way he might be thoroughly equipped. And as we pointed out many times before, uh, that word is from a nautical term which the old-time sailor would equip the ship with everything they knew for every contingency. They didn't have modern technology, but even with modern technology, the ship captain uh, really doesn't know everything he's going to face as he sails out or powers out across the ocean. God does. God is never caught off guard. 
we can never go to him and he says, well, you know, I, I just didn't know you were going to face that. <laughs> and again, the more we are deep in the word of God, the more we understand God and who he is, and therefore we are comforted. Uh, we're not caught up with the, uh, the uh, false teachings of the world about God. This brings us to uh, a great place to, to look in thinking about who God is and using the word of God to know God. Uh, when you read the word of God, one of, the, one of the revelations that comes to us is that the world does not revolve around me. <laughs> what? Now, probably none of us have ever said, honey, you need to understand the world revolves around me. <laughs> we don't say that. We just kind of live that way. We just kind of hope that. And we, exp we expose our denial of that every time we get offended. So Job is a wonderful, wonderful book in the Bible that really helps us with this. The story with Joseph is another one. Daniel. Um, most of all, Jesus. Uh, all the things that were put on his plate. From, from your understanding of the book of Job, uh, what are some things that stand out to you? He doesn't blame Satan. He doesn't blame Satan. Okay. Gives God the glory. Gives, okay. Gives God the glory. He does more than give God the glory. He gives God responsibility. Yes. The Lord gave. The Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, we don't know what else Job may have known. We have the blessedness of having the scripture, and we know that, in fact, Satan was involved, but not as a loose cannon. He was on a string. He was under, uh, if we say Satan was in submission, it's unwilling submission, but he was on a leash. He was restricted to what God ordained that he could do. Could you say he was under God's authority? Absolutely. Uh, there's nothing that is not under God's authority. Right. So, when, when, uh, it, when I'm tempted then to be resentful, or to be angry, or to be bitter, something has got on my plate, and I don't like it. Someone has done or said something, and I don't like it. And it may be wrong. And, and, and instead of me pointing the finger at them, it's trying to straighten them out, God is wanting to manifest his spirit to me and through me. And so when that anger starts rising up, and you know, as uh, I don't know that grandparents have this so much because they just tend to spoil kids. <laughs> but you can't raise kids and you can't uh, have kids uh, as young parents without uh, dealing with some frustration, without having to uh, put a cap on your own anger. Uh, how many parents have had to say, I've been, uh, my, my child, my son, my daughter is just full of anger. And then you look in the mirror and you found out where they got it. So many come in, okay, I want you to fix my child. He's got anger. And I say, time out, God wants to transform you. That's not preaching, that's meddling. <laughs> It's where the rubber meets the road. So, related to this, uh, he said, the Lord gave, the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, God knew, uh, Job knew God, and through the storms of life, he continued to trust him. Here's the reality. When we're in the dark valley, God seldom gives us an explanation. God seldom gives us an explanation when we're in the dark valley. 
we're wanting an explanation. And when you read the book of Job, I mean, he has his ups and downs, especially when his friends are talking to him and giving him a lot of flack and misinformation. And, and we, we could say that in their minds and hearts, God was too small. They didn't understand. And Job had a little of that as well. But at the same time, he would say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And when he is finished, I shall come forth as goal. So here is this underlying vision and passion of trust in God and of knowing what God is up to, even though I don't understand why he's putting this on my plate. Though he slay me, yet I will I trust him. S some of the next portion of this comes from uh, Steve Brown's book, When Your Rope Breaks. It's out of print, but I, you can probably find it at a used book place on Amazon or wherever. And uh, I would encourage you to buy it and get it. Okay? And, and here, again, we, we must underscore, here is where bad theology will trip you up big time. Especially bad theology about God. I read this this week, I'm at this point planning to use it tomorrow, so if you hear it again tomorrow, it's not because I don't remember that I said it today. <laughs> but it's a little booklet entitled, How to Forgive God. And let's think about that. Why would any Christian pastor or teacher be writing a booklet about how to forgive God. God needs our forgiveness. And it's built around the story. And your thing with Job brought it up in my mind. Here's a, here's a woman, a Christian woman, is the way it's presented, and her four-year-old child dies. I don't remember how. But she's angry at God because her child was taken. And so the book is written, the booklet is written, instructing people on how to forgive God when things like that tumble in. Now, maybe we don't go that far, and I hope we don't, but if I'm angry at God, I'm about one or two steps away from, uh, I might be uh, susceptible to the teaching of you need to learn to forgive God. R kin to that is you need to learn to forgive yourself. The Bible doesn't teach either one of those. In forgiveness, you have to have something to, with which to pay. And I can't, I can't forgive God. I don't have, first of all, he's never offended me. Uh, he's God, I'm not. And he has a right to do with his creatures and his creation as he will. And as you study the Bible, you find that he is holy, he is righteous. And, and Abraham, way back in the Old Testament, had it right. Will not the God of all the earth do right? And, and this was not, this was like a rhetorical question the answer of which is, yes, the God of the earth will do right. Doesn't mean we understand it, but the place of worship, the place of submission, the place that is right for us, we're the creature. He's the creator. He's God. We're not. He is righteous. He is holy. He will never do anything that is unrighteous. And in a fallen world, bad things happen. Bad from our perspective. Whether you're, you, you being a believer doesn't make you immune to that. Now this is foundational to winning the battle over resentment and being offended and being angry. Because when I'm, I may not connect this with God, but if I'm offended and resentful and angry because of who or what got dumped on my plate, do, do I realize what I'm really doing? I am questioning 
the integrity of God. I'm questioning the management of God. I'm accusing God of mismanaging my life. Now, we could say, going back to Job, that maybe he got a little bit close to that. Because if you remember in part of Job, he's saying, you know, God, if you were just down here, I, I'd like for you to understand a few things. That's paraphrase, but that's the essence. Well, guess what? God showed up and just in verse after verse for about two chapters, just where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did this? And as righteous as Job was, according to God's estimation, no man like my man Job. Yet he had so much to learn. He was like in kindergarten. And when God got through revealing himself, he was in sackcloth and ashes in repentance. And God restored him. And one of the first things he had him to do was to pray for his friends and others, the people in his world. And some have said, well, that's fine for Job. But what about his children? Well, what's wrong with heaven? And so when, when unspeakable things come across our plate and you're viewing the casket or dealing with the death of someone who died way before time would normally call them and you're struggling with that you don't have to deny the reality of your emotions your sense of loss uh, the emotion of hurt the emotion of loneliness but you have to top it off and come on top of it with but Lord you're God you're perfect you do all things well you were so gracious to give me that child for the 10 years I had them, or had her or him. You've been so kind and merciful to me. And we can be honest with God. I'm hurting, but I want to worship you. You're worthy of worship and worthy of praise. I don't understand this, but I know enough of you that you do all things well and right and Maybe even before I die, I'll understand that what you did was the best. And maybe, maybe whether it's something like that or something else, you can look back at things about which you were very angry and resentful and bitter. And you would live long enough to realize, wow, that's the best thing that could have ever happened to me. So back again, God has invited us to a party, but it's not your party, it's his. <laughs> Get that book, uh, When Your Rope Breaks, by Stephen Brown. It's a blessing. All right? So in all of this, we've, the underlying point is to stay close to Jesus. He has a section in the book that he is a fellow sufferer. Job, what Job asked for, uh, yes, he got this in direct encounter where God just exposes his small mind and how great God was, and he's left worshiping, but Jesus came down. And that's why it is so important to be reading and meditating upon the Gospels on a regular basis. We need to be reminded again and again of Jesus our fellow sufferer. Someone turn to Ephesians 4 15 and read that as we talk about building bridges of love so that truth might be delivered. So in, in dealing with uh, attitudinal things especially as they relate to others uh, uh, dealing with people in love, speaking the truth in love uh, that's a that's a front line war zone situation, and it's a place where we need to tie in the scriptures, not to be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, to bless, uh, to do good, 
to walk in the steps of Jesus. Again, the latter chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus being uh, wrongfully treated, shamefully treated, and he never got his eyes off of pleasing the Lord. People like to compartmentalize Jesus, and some will say, oh, well, he was a good man, and they don't see he is redeemer. And sadly, there are those who, who rejoice in his redemption and that he had to pay our sin debt, but we, we minimize the value of, of his obedient life. We minimize meditating upon Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to see how he dwelt with, with, with bad people or with the uh, denseness of his disciples or with uh, the betrayer, him knowing all, while, all along that Judas was a betrayer, and yet he demonstrated nothing but kindness to him. Well, how can you do that? Even as for the man Christ Jesus, that's supernatural. And I say even as the man Christ Jesus because he was living as a man, as God intended man to live, not living in the strength of his a deity. He never ceased to be God. He remained God, but he lived as a man, dependent upon his Father for all things. And so he had to be looking beyond and what Judas was doing and what he was going to do to realize my Father is in charge here, and he does all things well. I'm trusting him. So I'm not going to get off course from my assignment. I have an assignment here. We're no different. In every situation, we have an assignment. And I may not understand all the details, but I can know and understand my assignment is to demonstrate the character of Jesus Christ here. To love, to bless, to pray for, to do good. Um, and so there's a statement here, the greater the load of truth we must deliver, the greater the bridge of love we must build. There's someone in your life, and they themselves are blind. Blinded by Satan. They may, they may or may not be lost. Now, I can tell you what won't help. You go to one of us, or you go to somebody else, and you say, well, I don't think they're saved. Or you won't believe what they're doing. And, and so we, we give uh, false reports. We give reports from our side. Um, if you ever go for marriage counseling, please do not go in a situation where the counselor said, now I'll meet with you, sir, um, privately, and I'll meet with you, ma'am, privately. So if, if a couple is having problems, and um, Luke is the counselor, and the man goes to Luke and unfolds it from his side, the woman goes to Luke and unfolds it from her from her side, what's he got? <laughs> You've got a, a, a jaded looking at the situation, which is what's fueling the problem anyway. And I've had a number of times when I would meet with the couple together, and I would listen to them in each other's presence, talking about each other. And then I would say, I believe both of you. I believe everything that you have said. I believe that you believe what you've just said, number one. Number two, I don't believe a word you said because I was not there. And I don't know where you colored it one side or the other, but God does. And so what we're going to do is I'm not going to try to figure out who's telling the truth and who's deceived and who's got it right and who's got it wrong. I'm, we're going to lay the word of God over it. And ma'am, here's God's word for you. And sir, here's God's word for you. And what he or she has done in the past does, is, doesn't matter. Here's God's word for you. Now, are you going to take it and go with it? Are you willing for God to be God in your life? And in all situations where we have offended spirits, we have to come to that place where we're willing for God to be God in our life. 
But so if, if the other person is weighted down with misconceptions, with deceptions and under the thumb of the devil and all the rest, we may well be accurate in our belief about that. Who can change them? God can. And the most powerful weapon that you will have is not an offended spirit, not a judgmental spirit, but a compassionate spirit. And a spirit that lives the truth and, and gives the truth uh, in a humble way. The next point is to live to please God and build up others. We're talking about proactive actions and attitudes. See, I, I, if my mind is filled with or is tempted to be filled with resentments and bitterness and an offense, what am I going to fill my mind with? How am I going to get that out? I can't just grunt, uh, uh, grunt and, and grimace and just, uh, just merely say, well, I'm not going to do that. But I must, again, focus on cultivating my relationship with the Lord and having a, a passion and a, a vision of what God wants to do in me and through me. And, again, underlying the reality I'm here to please the Lord and to edify others. The scriptures in the epistles talks about the words that we speak should edify. That's the concept of building up. So we keep a God focus. When I, have, when I don't have a God focus, there are many things that will be messed up in my life, but there's going to be something that's that's very powerful that will be missing. And that's joy. How much do we meditate upon the fact that no one had more negative stuff dumped on them than Jesus did, yet he never lost his joy? And he was not happy because he had entertainment. He was not happy because... I'm so glad they are doing all this bad stuff to me. He was rejoicing in the Lord. He was rejoicing in doing his Father's will. The scripture says he was anointed with the oil of gladness above all others. How could he be that way? He was pleasing his Father. That was his passion. And so over in the Old Testament we're told the joy of the Lord is our strength. Why do we fizzle in the fight? Joy is missing. Why is joy missing? We've got our thinking priorities out of whack. We're not focused on living to please the Lord. We're not focused on submitting to his lordship. We're not focused on I'm here to make Christ manifest to that person. Offenses will come. And so uh, Jesus, as the man Christ Jesus, spent an enormous amount of time with his father. And so at the very moment of intense warfare, uh, his, God's word is hid within his heart. And so he takes up his shield of faith and, and wards off the attacks of the enemy. Even when the enemy starts quoting scripture, he recognizes it's out of context and cannot penetrate into the mind of Jesus. So, uh, there are a number of scriptures that reveal the awesome power of a God-focused life. And a God-focused life is one that is empowered not to lose our joy. You can have joy even while you're, ha while you're having tears. You're having tears because you're human and there may be pain 
because of something that's been done to you or there may be hurt and anguish because you see another person enslaved and yet you don't lose your joy because you realize that by the grace of God you're able to forgive, you're able to bless, you're able to do good, you're not enslaved with bitterness, resentment, you're not offended. Walking in the steps of Jesus. We will um, make mention of one more point here in the material. It talks about keeping away from talebearers. Um, one of the things that will get us off track is to listen to if if I may not be presently struggling with something or with someone. In fact, I may have a good relationship with them. But then a talebearer comes along and tells you how horrible that person that you have this good relationship with, how horrible that person has been to them. And you take up an offense. It's a, it's a, it's a painful thing to become the victim of a talebearer. It's the worst thing to be a talebearer. And there's so many scriptures that warn us. And there's nothing more that more dangerous possibly to set you up for a fall with an offended spirit than to believe the word of a talebearer. So there's a number of scriptures that warn us about the deep wounds, the strife, and the separation of even close friends all because of tail bearers. All right, well, let's pray. Father, we bless you for the truth of your word. Uh, you, you come at us from a lot of different angles, giving us uh, abundant ammunition, abundant resources, uh, abundant armament to win the, battle, the battles with attitudes, resentments, anger, all those things. Help us to be alert. Help us to go forward into a fallen world as your soldiers walking in the steps of Jesus, walking in the joy of the Lord, walking with our eyes on the prize of being with the Lord in heaven for all eternity, seeing the privilege that is ours to suffer for righteousness' sake. And for these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.